first question relates to Alam uh, Palin. Because if you have to plan for an LNG industry, gas industry, we need to know how do we make that seamlessly uh, integrated with the new vision of Alam Palin. So the question is, do we know how much research do we still have in Alam Palin? and how long it can still last. We know that the GSPAs will end in 2024. The PSAs will end some time later after that, although one PSA is ending in 2020, then as you say, the ending in 2022. So I think it's important for us to uh, know exactly when Malam Pai will be distributed. So what has the department uh, taken us steps to determine when Maalang Paya will be defeated. I think that question is for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, uh, come 2024, the GSPA will expire, as so you mentioned. And uh, we, we've done a simulation with this. We studied it with PMOCEC, who is one of the members of the consortium. And uh, as per simulation that was done, it will be depleted until, uh, 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 it will start depletion 2022, then 2024 continues to deplete, and after that, only 1,000 megawatts can be provided. So after 2027. So after 2027, we are not, uh, we are not looking at even 1,000 uh, megawatts supply, as per simulation that we have done. But with this uh, Philippine Downs and Natural Gas Regulation, we have also established three business models. One is the integrated LNG terminal, which we are doing right now. The second one is, if we find a discovery somewhat feasible, economically feasible with a pipeline like Malampaya, it's one of the business models. And if it's really too far from the integrated uh, receiving terminal, we might as well consider it is ready to be there. We might as well uh, consider the economic viability of coming up with a liquefaction near that discovery if it is not really economically viable to have a pipeline. So we are ready on those uh, on those uh, schemes, and of course, CIRIC uh, also together with OIMB and the the Philippine Downstream uh, Natural Gas uh, Review Evaluation Committee which is lower than CREC, is coming up with, a, uh, with an objective recommendation come earlier next year to come up with three possible things in, in treating the depletion of Malapaya. One, because the, the contract, the service contract will also expire in 2024. So an objective recommendation will be presented to the Secretary and then the Secretary will later on endorse it to the President. So what are those two, uh, three schemes that we are looking at? First, renewal of contract with the uh, SCTA. Second, a government-to-government -government, uh, agreement, maybe with the NOCEC. Uh, I, was, I have already mentioned that to the good senator when we were asking the, the hearing. And third is to bid it, a bit bid it. Because the, as the president had mentioned, transparency and accountability in any project should be present. And uh, there should be always a competitive selection process. So, uh, the, uh, the good uh, president of TPVP uh, mentioned that uh, there should be always a vibrant competition in whatever uh, project we are going to do in this, uh, in this industry. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Yes, please. This, oh, the better? Apologies. I was just uh, I want to compliment the government on the clear study that you've already done about the viability of Malampaya, and also that you're in a very similar situation to others in the region. Uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, all face the exact same problem of a, of a depleting or depleted domestic supply. Concerns about what the long-term viability of it is. And in both, in actually all three cases, the governments have determined that they're going to do what we call an all of the above approach. They're both going to relicense those reservoirs for enhanced stimulation, for enhanced recovery, and bring LNG online, because it's precisely the word they use, is, is competition. Ideally, there's, there's really no market where there's such a thing as too much gas. 
And if you have both LNG and, and the luck of enhancing your existing fields or discovering new fields, then what you have is gas on gas competition. You have supply, you have volume, and that unlocks new possibilities in the market. So in almost every case where we've seen a country facing both depleting their domestic resources and potential for imports, they have to do them as being complementary, not competition. At the end of the day, those volumes actually expand the utility in the market. They don't cause challenges in the market. So this is not a unique challenge to the Philippines. Many other countries are facing the same choice. Yes, sir. I think you have a follow-up question. Yeah, I have a second question. Um, uh, what, in your experience, uh, sir, let me see. Uh, what has underpinned the growth of LNG in other countries? Uh, how were Angkor or Keystone PSAs, our supply agreements, given? Uh, was it given because that is a mandated generation mix? Or were those PSAs taken because they won in a competitive selection process? Uh, it's, there's, there's a couple different formulations of the answer to that. that. The majority of the cases in this region where LNG has been brought into the market, you have a very basic um, situation. You have, as I said, domestic supply is falling down. You have existing gas supply agreements for power. And the government is the gas aggregator. The government is the gas sales point. So the government already has an obligation to deliver gas to power projects. And what they're doing is they're basically purchasing insurance. They're insuring themselves that when domestic supply falls, they have a secondary source of LNG. So that's the easiest case. Where the government is the seller of gas, the government buys LNG and resells it domestically. You do have examples where LNG is coming to purely private markets. You have both a private importer and a private buyer. You see this in Chile and in Colombia and more in Latin America than you see in this part of the world. And in that case, you sometimes see a blending of domestic and imported LNG so that there's a, a blended cost that's passed through to consumers at the end of the day as, as the fuel cost for those power partners. Or you just see open competition where LNG has to compete with domestic gas and sometimes it's not competing on price, it's competing on stability. The fact that LNG can be delivered over a period of time consistently, and as we've seen in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, is the flexibility of LNG. There are countries in Africa, and I think we have the same situation here, that have a significant hydro base load, and they're using LNG to fill in the seasonality of hydro. So when you have lower hydro in winter, and you have in a higher production type, lower hydro in the summer and higher production in the winter, they're actually adjusting their LNG cargo to match their hydro profile. So it's not always a price game. Sometimes LNG gives you flexibility, it gives you stability in addition to price competition. It depends on the type of market that you're dealing with at the end of the day. Uh, may I just add that for a uh, Here in the Philippines, we have to do that. And what Ipina has done is to cause a monumental change in the power industry. Where previously uh, it is a seller's market under a uh, state monopoly, it uh, made a buyer's market where the dealers have the responsibility of getting these cost for their supply for their customers. And we also have a contestable market where end users choose uh, from where they will buy uh, their supply. So essentially it's a price driven market. Now if LNG uh, is to survive in a competition, or if we want to promote competition, then LNG has to compete with, uh, with coal. And currently, uh, studies that I have seen, and several of these, uh, looks at a situation where after the depletion of Malampaya, we will need LNG. It's still the least cost part. But LED is not a base load plant anymore. It will be running on mid-merry. And the mid-merry volume that we're looking at is maybe 800,000 metric tons per year to about 1.2 uh, metric tons per year. But that just leaves it as a mid-merry uh, plant. So if, if we allow competition, uh, then uh, LNG will be in a nuclear duty. If the Department of Energy will push uh, its uh, uh, renewable portfolio standard, then the nuclear duty of uh, LNG will be squeezed out some more. Uh, 
The other is something that uh, we have seen is that if you don't have uh, LNG, then it will cost the market maybe uh, 11 percent more over a for 20 period. If, uh, if we force LNG to run in Greystone, then it will cost the market at the current prices uh, compared between coal and, and LNG. It will cost the market about 9 percent more. So there's, there's a cost to pay if you force the market to, uh, to run uh, those gas plants on base load on energy. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yeah, I think, um, just yeah, I think uh, we just let the market, you know, I mean, let the market decide. I mean, the, I mean, it's, it, it may be true that right now, you know, we may lose, use. no one is forcing the use of LNG. Okay? If there is a supply for it, because the, the, the suppliers of LNG will probably determine that they are still viable in that particular business. So it will settle down. We don't really know whether, you know, I, I did a study on that uh, between coal and LNG. Those prices are fluctuating and there are some probabilities that, you know, LNG uh, based uh, fuels can be more competitive compared to uh, coal. So I think uh, the market will just give us the answers. And uh, at the moment, I think with uh, Santa Rita, the first gen, it, it serves as a base load now. Meaning, if you have recovered already the capex, and there's always CSP <laughs> on whatever, is, I think. Uh, uh, LNG can play around. And even well, considering the intermittency of the renewable energy, although there's an effects for that, the renewable performance standard, but still, we are looking at a 43,675 uh, megawatts come 2040, and 20% of that is most likely the mid merit. So I think the flexibility of LNG will play a vital role in this. Uh, uh, technology, of course, for Thank you, speakers. I think we have another question. Sir? If you could just expand on the experience so, uh, of Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Pakistan uh, regarding the record, sorry. Uh, because um, if we are going to choose, at least for the companies, if we're going to choose between an offshore and an onshore, one of the biggest risks that we have to face is that we are in the type of belt. Uh, we experience 20 typhoons a uh, year. And, well, in the case of Bangladesh and Myanmar, or even Pakistan, they do also experience typhoons, but not the same intensity and frequency as in the Philippines. Uh, and if the FSR you will have to leave whenever there's a typhoon, uh, you lose not just your energy capacity, uh, your energy supply, you also use your gasification facility. So the option for the gas plants is either to shut down entirely, disrupting your supply of power, or they switch on to alternative fuel, which, as we know, is much more expensive. So my question is, um, in the case of those other countries, what were the contingencies placed, uh, put in place by their uh, regulations in events wherein there are typhoons and they have you know, FSRs who have to evacuate? It's, it's a very good question. And the answer, of course, that everybody gives is that it depends on what you want to buy. Because if you're buying a facility, if you're contracted with the, with the LNG, you get to determine the quality of that contract. What that means, for example, in Bangladesh is that Bangladesh required that accelerate, in that case the provider of uh, FSRU, be able to certify what we call an uptime, downtime delta. They were able to certify that if there was, a, we call it a med-ocean event, a meteorological event in the ocean, that they'd be able to take the facility offline, take it out the ocean, you know, survive that event maybe today, maybe it's two weeks longer, and then come back within a certain period. So the government could actually predict how quickly that on and off time would take place and start to practice it around it. Uh, the second reality is that FSRU technology has gotten significantly uh, better. They have been more employing so that the technologies. We see they use in high volatility environments. If you go to Mexico, or Mexico, you know, uh, where we have hurricanes, you know, and uh, typhoons, you've seen it used in the Caribbean, you've seen it used in, uh, in other parts of the world. So I, I think it's a question of simply, yes, being realistic with our limitations for that technology, and you price in those limitations, and if you realize that maybe the savings of FSRUs are worth <laughs> a slight difference compared to the stability you take with offshore, that's an economic decision. It's an economic decision which you make in negotiation. The last thing I'll say too is that with the onshore terminals, your energy ships can't come in during that movement. 
So yes, the facility you say is online, and it says it's a storage unit, you're absolutely correct. But your supply is still disrupted because no ship is coming in port, hopefully, during a typhoon uh, situation. So there are limitations above that. And it is very important to be aware of those limitations. I mean, it's a virtual pipeline, but it's not a real pipeline. It is subject to the same meta Hi, thank you. I think we have room for uh, one last question. Yeah, I think um, we as a Japan has been uh, one of the uh, most experienced countries. And then uh, my question is that uh, talking about energy contracts for supply, you have to think about the price risk associated with and the volume risk associated with. And uh, my question is how do you see Tony uh, Mohammed, uh, how to apply any regulations or any government supports to realize energy supply to this country, which I mean is that in Japan's case, or most of the country's case, uh, I don't know how much all of you are familiar with the energy supply in the whole places. There should be always uh, take up pay clauses. And of course, the price is always, uh, most of the cases, linked to oil prices. And some of the cases in the future, more can be happening in prices. And in Japan, of course, we uh, already uh, we have a table of credit losses. And uh, in Japan, we have a price adjustment mechanism to make sense, so to speak. And in the US case, each state or public utility commission of each state has a uh, similar cost adjustment price mechanisms. So, which I mean is cost pass through mechanism is always in this energy or natural gas industry, most of the countries. So, what would you think how you could, or this country could deal with these price risks associated with and volume risks? Excuse me, sir, may we ask for your name and ah, name? sorry. Uh, my name is Nakagami and Tokyo Gans, uh, one of the uh, largest producers <laughs> in Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that question. And thank you for the reminder of a very important point that you said there at the end, that at the end of the day, the part of the market that bears the real cost of LNG is the household and industrial consumer. We're, we're talking about facilities, we're talking about terminals, but you're right, at the end of the day, Price protection, the real you know, uh, mission of a regulator is to protect those consumers at the very end of the value chain. So I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, let me mention a, a couple of strategies, and this is just a very brief summary. It's very important that when you enter the LNG market, you don't just think about molecules, you don't just think about gas and volume, you think about timing and you think about demand types. So, for example, a long term take or pay agreement, 10, 15, even longer agreements is more useful when you know you have stable volume of demand. For example, replacing gas for existing power facilities. You may know the volumes of gas that are necessary, you may have some estimation of what the depletion of the domestic reserve is, and you may be comfortable contracting in the long term for that stable demand that you have in your market because of the existing power facilities and passing through that cost. The more volatile demand, like your peaker plants, like the fact that you may use LNG to convert to CNG fuel for transportation purposes, you may in the future containerize LNG and take the different islands. I mean, we do this in the Caribbean now in the US where we have ISO containers of LNG. Your more variable demand may be better suited to short-term or spot purchases in the market. The very basic thing that I can say is this, is that countries must study their demand in very fine detail and have a very keen understanding, not just of volume, but timing of that volume, the pricing flexibility of those consumer speakers who maybe can afford a higher price, base low, can. And then you blend that volume, you blend that demand into a purchasing strategy. I mentioned the fact that in Pakistan, they layered five, 10, and 15 year contracts. Um, Bangladesh is doing the same thing. I think the old model of one purchase agreement for 20 years at one price is gone. I think now countries are blending sources, they're blending purchase options, and they're hedging in the market. But in order to hedge, have to know your market. And that's a lot of study. I mean, we just saw a demand study in South Africa where it was a 25-year study of gas demand on a second-to-second -second basis. Second by second, it took up 500 gigabytes of space, this, this model, because what they did is they estimated their likely solar production, the 
molecular wind production, and the intermittency of that production, and how gas would fill in that gap. And they were to project that over a 20 year period to give themselves a sense of when they would be buying gas, and not just how much gas they'd be buying. So I thank you for the question. And you really do have to protect the consumer by making sure you're buying gas on the most um, reasonable and responsible basis possible. Yes, I believe that's all. Uh, I hate being the guy who is uh, between you and your lunch. That's that's the worst place to be in. Uh, so I, I, was, I was actually hoping that they would just we would just end the whole farm and go go straight to lunch. It would make all of us a bit happier. Uh, but then again, uh, we'd also like to take this opportunity first to tell everybody how happy we are that the request of the Department of Energy for technical assistance from the then EPDP has come to fruition and is now. Finally, the gas policy development project. So we're very happy about that. We'd also like to take this opportunity to share with you, because we will be working together. This will be a platform where the Department of Energy will be working with our members from the academe, from our colleagues and stakeholders in the private sector. This will be the platform where we'll be working together and hopefully developing the much needed policies to drive the natural gas industry in the country. So I'd like to take this opportunity, because we will be working together, to give you an idea about how shall we say, the, 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 uh, the concepts and the attitudes that essentially guide our team in the Department of Energy when we come with, up with the, the policies. So when we'll be working together, we'll be uh, developing policies together. It will be a good idea for you to, to, uh, to have an idea about how, how we come about with our policies in DOE. So um, to give you a short background of who I am, I come from the private sector. I've only been in the government for two years, which is uh, both uh, a blessing and curse. Um, and uh, uh, since I'm from the private sector, when we first started de developing policies in the Department of Energy, uh, I had to share certain principles, and that's that's the, the principles that we're governing that govern our team now. And the first of them, and, I, I, and uh, our members of our team are laughing right now, they're smiling right now, because they hear this from me all the time. The enemy of great is perfect. I keep saying this in all the the bureaus and services that I work with. Whenever we develop policies, whenever we develop rules or regulations, I always tell them the enemy of great is perfect. Why? One of the first things that I noticed um, in entering government, when, when government tries to develop policy, there's a concern about criticism. There's a concern about trying to please every sector affected. And I keep telling them we can't. If you go for perfection, you will never attain it. What we want <coughs> is to be great. What we want is to be good enough to address every potential problem that we can envision. What we want is to be able to listen to every member or every sector, consider all their perspectives, and at the end, be guided with central principles for the betterment of our country, and issue those policies. So we go on to the next principle that we keep hearing from you. And the second principle is, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Which means, let's issue it and let's see what happens. If we are afraid of issuing these policies, we will never learn. Every time I go in front of people, every time I talk to people, every time we write something, I'm always open to be called a fool. I'm always open for people to say, you made a mistake. I'm always, I always embrace the possibility of looking stupid because it's an opportunity to learn. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to be the dumbest. Because if I'm the dumbest guy in the room, I get to learn more, which is great. And this is why we are so happy right now. We want to take this opportunity to say, we are so happy to see all of these faces and all of these peoples and all of these, these uh, technical people, all of these uh, expertise in different areas right here in this same room, and we are excited to work with you. And finally, we'd like to say that lunch is going to be great. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it's going to be good. And it's going to make you happy. And it's going to make you go home with a smile on your face. So again, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you for your participation. And please, we look forward to working with you. Thank you.